For some, the art of performance just seems to come naturally. I am not one of these people. When I was 10 years old and in the fifth grade, my class put on a production of HMS Pinafore. And no, I'm not in any of these pictures behind you. That is because of the 40 students in my class, I was one of three who patently refused to get up on stage. For some, the idea of standing up and singing in front of a room full of your friends and family just paralyzed me with fear. So, due to my rather dramatic protestations, I was relegated to running the spotlight instead of being in it. From the back of the gymnasium, in the shadows there, I watched my friends up on stage, and I secretly longed to be up there with them, ironically. Strange, but true. However, while I was back there, I did manage to discover one of my lifelong passions, that of critiquing and analyzing other people's performances. <laughs> my inner theater director was born. Since elementary school, the egg to perform has increased and eventually won out, and through sheer force of will and many, many terrible, terrible tragedies, I have forced myself to get on stage many times and face my fears. By college, I was a theater junkie and a theater major. <laughs> While at school, I analyzed and... <laughs> yes, I knew this would happen. While I was in college, I observed and analyzed my struggle with the panic to get on stage and all the internal contortions that I would put myself through before doing so. I learned a lot about myself in the process. I learned about vulnerability. <laughs> that was recently. Thanks, Sparks. Um, I learned about vulnerability, about honesty, and to love myself even through this process. Through singing, especially, I found a much needed outlet for feelings that otherwise had no means for expression. And little by little, it clearly has gotten easier for me to get on stage. <laughs> Go! There's an immediacy to performance that I liken to skydiving. For a thrill seeker, it is addictive. And for others, it's just plain terrifying. But whether you're acting or singing or dancing or teaching or giving a TED talk, the moment that you step on stage and begin to express yourself in front of others, you discover that you must contend with two worlds simultaneously, the inner world and the outer world. Or put another way, what you intend versus what actually happens. <laughs> In the midst of a performance, like right now, I feel my heart working overtime to display and, and present and, and give birth to some pure expression. Meanwhile, my body is trying to work just as hard to deliver the heart's message and still maintain some semblance of control while doing so. The brain, bless its little heart, sits in the background and graciously doles out all kinds of feedback and criticism as soon as you step on stage and open your mouth. <laughs> Thanks, brain. And it's this trinity that can create a feedback loop within you and derail even the most seasoned performers, if not kept in check. So really, in the moment of expression, you are trying to find and man maintain a kind of zen-like balance inside your entire instrument to best deliver the heart's message. And nothing disrupts this equilibrium quite like the very act of singing in front of a group. So on the first day of one of my classes, that is exactly what we do. I gather them together in a group, and we learn a very simple little melody sung on la. It repeats, so it's easy to remember, and there's no words, so that's easy. And when we feel comfortable singing it together as a group, I then ask them to fan out into a circle. And then one by one, each in turn, sing this short little repeating melody to the rest of the group by themselves. And the only thing I ask that they do while doing this is to look directly in the eyes of every single person in the circle as they go. Well, the results of this very simple exercise are for me just fascinating and vulnerable and unexpected in what happens. There are tragedies and triumphs and a whole lot of empathy generated by the group because they all know that eventually they're going to have to do this too. 
There's the requisite wandering of pitch and rhythm, gasping for air, uncontrollable fidgeting, you know, even some like playing with the clothes and unknown things, and then there's some tears sometimes, and of course, outright refusal to participate, which I'm particularly sympathetic for. <laughs> but we go around the circle more than once, with the idea being that each time you do it, you have room to make improvements and to face your fears, which, of course, is the whole point of this exercise. Invariably, if they go around a second time, then they do make little improvements, and this 10-step process is about that. Whenever I like to teach or learn something new, I, I try and take a complex co topic and break it down into smaller achievable goals so that the whole process feels a bit more manageable and students have something concrete that they can focus on at any given time, one thing rather than a million things, yeah? So I built this, uh, this simple little list as a means to, it's kind of like a ladder for climbing the sheer cliff that is performance singing. The first one, you might think, oh, that's kind of a gimme, but you'd be surprised just how difficult it is for some people to just simply show up and survive the very act of singing in front of a group. My rule of thumb here is show up and don't throw up. Can you do that? <laughs> Check, you're a tenth of the way there. Easy, achievable. Then, once you've survived once, you've quickly realized that you're gonna have to deal with the lyrics, getting the right words in the right order at the right time, and soon thereafter, the pitches, the right notes in the right order at the right time. How many of you in the audience would say that you are a singer? Great. How many of you would say, I am a non-singer? Okay, good. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Repeat after me. La. I hereby pronounce you all singers. <laughs> Many musicians have been quoted as saying that music is the space between the notes. And in singing, of course, that's where the breath goes. We don't want to be gasping for air like a drowning person. We want controlled, intentional breath throughout, as controlled and intentional as the lyrics and the notes. Likewise, it's time to give up your fidgeting and find your inner poise intentional and controlled stature throughout. If there's something you're not aware of that you're doing, figure it out and get rid of it. Have you ever tried to stand on stage and do nothing? It is very, very difficult, right? So if you're going to make some kind of a gesture, do something that enhances what it is that you're doing rather than distracting from it. If you're going to use a microphone, make it an extension of your instrument, which is, of course, your body. Right? In a perfect world, the audience forgets that it's even there, that you've used one at all. Next is interpretation, and this is where you begin to make a personal connection with the song, so that you can begin to make choices about delivery and things like feelings and texture and uh, color and a character, if there is such a thing, for your song. Let's not forget to leave a little room for playfulness, because music is, after all, a conversation with others. Right? You have to leave yourself open for the possibility of little surprises happening within the context of the song and be able to respond to them in real time, right? So that the song is fresh every single time you go through it. If you've got all eight of these going for you, it's probably a good time to start thinking about adding an audience to what you do. <laughs> and this is a big step. This is a big step. Uh, an audience provides a conversation with you from the stage as well. It's not just a broadcast that you are up here doing. You must connect with the people who you are singing to and let them into your process. And when you do that, this little wheel begins to turn of giving and receiving of energy. Giving, receiving, receiving, and giving. And on a very good day, on a very special and rare day, when that wheel really gets going, you make room for the possibility of what I like to call embodiment. And this is when you can simply step out of your own way and the song sings you rather than the other way around. It's a magic experience. You can forget all of the previous eight, nine steps because you don't need them. You are simply in that moment surfing on the music. Some people call it an out-of-body experience, but you are just an unwitting conduit, a channel for 
the message of your heart and beyond. Pure bliss. So I made this list as a means for continuing the dialogue between our inner and outer word, worlds, sort of identifying the different moving parts there, and as well helping to liberate our own you know, self-imposed limitations from our instrument. Want to see me give it a go? Yeah. <laughs> Not the throwing up part. The, the, the. Martin Lund. You might know me for my foreigner, my journey, but this song is called and is for my one and only love. The very thought of you makes my heart sing like an April breeze on the wings of spring and you appear in all your splendor my one and only love the shadows fall and spread there mystic charms in the hush of night while you're in my arms I feel your lips so warm and tender my one and only love the touch of your hand is like heaven a heaven that I've never known the blush on your cheek whenever I speak tells me that you are my own you fill my eager heart with such desire Every kiss you give sets my soul on fire and I give myself in sweet surrender My one and only love One and all. 